Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, welcome for the very last time to Void Star Lab New York. This week, Brooke and I are getting in the van and we're driving all the way to Colorado to, uh, well, get to our new place and to set up our new workshop. So instead of the usual video, we're gonna dig into the mm, private reserves. This one uh, is about, well, the sloppy decisions that get left in commercial hardware and I gave it uh, at Hope 2020. That's awesome hacker con. Next week, we'll get back to our usual programming in our new workshop. Enjoy the show. Good evening, Hope attendees, and good whenever it is, uh, YouTube people. I'm Zach Friedman, prototype developer, and today we're making fun of some electronics. Welcome to my workshop in the beautiful West Village of New York, New York. Uh, don't listen to the president. Uh, the city is not being sacked by barbarians. That's me wearing an eye tracking headset I built. And uh, this is my workshop at the Fat Cat Fab Lab. The original plan was to throw an all night party here at the Fat Cat. But no, this viral bastard just has to invade our alveolar cells and ruin everything. I, I am digging this whole like hope over the Internet thing. I definitely miss all the late night shenanigans, but damn, there are so many excellent speakers and we've got all the time in the world to listen to them. For maximum immersion, I've brewed my own mate and ran it through the soda stream. It tastes like crap, which means I succeeded. All right, let's talk about filthy hacks. How many of you have ever busted open a piece of electronics to do a hardware hack? How many of you have built electronics yourself from the ground up? How many of you know that I actually recorded this a week ago? <laughs> All right, I've been building electronics for about a decade and I've been a freelance prototype developer for around eight years. Uh, I do a lot of engineering, but I'm not an engineer. Uh, I got my degree in business and technology at Stevens and I taught myself all the programming and circuits and stuff. I build a lot of projects for clients and myself, uh, my data glove, my eye tracking headset and a PC case mod that endlessly generates fake boot text. As a professional prototype developer, I build things like concept hardware, art pieces, uh, custom projects, and even the occasional product. My clients are satisfied, but I used to get awfully insecure about my work. My projects were made of copied and pasted reference designs, Arduinos, running off-the-shelf libraries, modified example code. I just didn't think that real engineers, like the ones that look like this, would consider my designs to be professional quality. I was a little terrified that one day a client would send my work to a real engineer and they'd shoot them an email back and say like, did you pay that jabroni? Or like maybe I'd forget to close some crazy security hole and some Russian hackers uh, would pwn the crap out of it and it ends up on the news and somebody does some sort of presentation at a hacker conference about it. Uh, I really did stay up late tossing and turning. Uh, because I left a label debug header in the release product, or I forgot to set a security fuse, or I made so many mistakes and none of my footprints fit the first time. And my heart would sink whenever a client sent me a picture like this. And I panicked, like, how did I let this happen? How could I have caused this? Time went on and I got more experience. I saw other people's projects inside and out, warts and all. I tore open products. Uh, to modify and reverse them. I read news stories, I sat through talks, I listened to podcasts, swapped stories, and it turns out many of those bonehead design decisions that I bumbled into are not unique. Uh, many of them are actually very common or even industry standard. So today we're gonna rip into real hardware that's been really released into the real world and discover filthy engineering. We are gonna see just eye-rolling levels of sloppiness, laziness, corner-cutting, short-sightedness, and uh, creativity. Before we begin, uh, we're gonna do three, just three points of context. Uh, A, just because something is disgusting doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, most of what I'm gonna show you is deliberate and came from calculated decisions with reasoning behind it. The, a lot of these things were done on purpose with intent. Engineers are, are generally diligent and good at their jobs, and it's usually the business realities that sully the product, not you know anyone being a smooth brain. Uh, point B, I'm, I really wanted to use my own projects here, but uh, 
my clients are not okay with me walking randos through the security flaws and, and mistakes I, I put in there. Uh, most of the examples are gonna be authentic mass market hardware with picks from sites that are okay with, with me doing such a thing. Uh, finally, I'm not a cybersecurity expert. Uh, I uh, am a prototype developer. My job is to implement the security flaws and I don't really know that much about exploiting them. Uh, I'm not purporting to be any kind of security expert, so I'm gonna take the academic approach. Uh, specifically, I leave the ponage as an exercise to the viewer. Okay, so all that said, uh, let's, let's get rolling. When you think of product design, you might think of a racially and culturally diverse group in comfortable but sensible attire, writing on whiteboards, annotating tablets, and rotating things in 3D. But, okay, you probably don't, but it is safe to assume they at least, you know, have meetings. Or at least the guy designing the enclosure uh, to hold the circuit board and the lady designing the circuit board itself would work together. Well, no. Uh, pretty often they work for different companies. Most companies don't have in-house industrial designers uh, or mechanical engineers. They engage a design firm and mechanical engineers to sculpt the, the physical stuff uh, or, or pick a model off the shelf. And then the engineers design the PCB to fit. Uh, the EE, in fact, might be an independent contractor themselves, like, you know, like myself. Electrical engineers are often left out of the high-level design process. Instead, they get an email with, hey, fit a workstation PC into this. Okay, thanks, bye. And you gotta make something that looks like this. Weirdly shaped boards are awkward and they're ugly. They're harder to design, they're harder to produce, and they're ugly. They also, like, uh, they also affect performance. They emit more noise, they, and time goes from improving the design and the schematic into cramming his, you know, all those components into that bizarre profile. Uh, really thin, tiny, and irregular boards flex more, and they need special programming fixtures and production steps. But they, I guess they, they make the design look sexy, and your boss doesn't have to pay the engineers uh, and the designers simultaneously. So for here's another example. Look at this pocket-sized uh, benchtop power supply. This poor bastard had to cut this giant hole in the ground plane so that it didn't get in the way of the wireless antenna. And by the way, like look how the uh, look how the module is only supported on one end, like a like a tiny diving board. Look at that control board. Like it had to be made of two scraps of PCB swaged together because those mounting bosses in the corners are too big for the main board to go all the way to the edge of the enclosure. And uh, as for those weirdly shaped cutouts and that, that strange board shape, that's there because the other board needs to pass through that board in order to fit that enclosure. Just like, look at this. Noise in a power supply is usually considered a bad thing, but the priority here was making it look like this. Here's another example. Uh, this is a speaker from Ikea. Just like, just take a look at this board. Here's the Bluetooth audio bit on a daughter board, and the audio it receives needs to make it all the way across the the, and the audio it receives needs to make it all the way across the board around that cutout to the speaker. Why does it need to do all that? So that you can ram a cork through this hole and stand it up. Aesthetics. Uh, you know where Nest thinks the best place to put a battery is? Literally in the middle of the sensor. Uh, just look at this board. Just look at it. Last example, uh, cameras. Cameras are the absolute worst because people expect them to look and feel like 35 millimeter film cameras from the 1960s. So boards are jammed in wherever they'll fit with ribbon cables snaking around components everywhere. Just like, look at this. Imagine designing electronics for this. You have to cram your super advanced image processing and digital signal processing chips onto a board that looks like a subway map. I also like how they put this heavy duty insulating boot around this massive capacitor, but they use this super fine pitch connector with like no creepage. So like a speck of anything conductive would short it out. Nice. So every electronic component has a data sheet. This is a document written by the manufacturer that explains how the chip works, its specs, tables of stats, what the package looks like, etc. cetera. Uh, but it also includes this, a reference design. This is sort of like a ready-to-go schematic. Uh, it's a schematic that implements the part that the manufacturer has tested uh, where each of its features are, are ready to use. Manufacturers sell evaluation boards and developer kits and third parties sell breakout boards and all of these usually implement those reference designs. 
Uh, these are extremely useful in the early stages of product development because you know you, you're starting with known working vanilla schematics. You don't need to engineer all that yourself. You can buy them pre-implemented and just chain the boards together for testing. You combine that with some open hardware that's easy to program, Arduinos, etc., and you know off-the-shelf modules for complex stuff like wireless, and you can jump right uh, into prototyping without having to start from scratch. The product development process ideally looks something like this. First, you slap a bunch of pre-made schematics together to sanity check your idea, refine the specs, and really focus in on your business logic, what the, what the thing does. You then put everything on a big roadkill board that has lots of open room so you can make adjustments and really you know, perfect that schematic. Finally, you take that and get it into the correct form factor, and that's your prototype. Uh, you trim unnecessary features, you add protective components, you tighten up your design, you replace these expensive modules, you solve problems, and you'd think that by the time you're done, very little of those off-the-shelf modules and pre-made reference designs would remain uh, in your finished product. I mean, it's not even like you're going to take your prototype straight to production, right? Well... The boss sees that the prototype works fine, uh, and DFM ends up being cut 25% off the bill of materials and goes straight to the contract manufacturer. So things that you put in early in the process to speed up your development end up making it all the way into the finished product. Uh, here's an example. This is my desk, uh, and it features a, a fifth generation ErgoDox mechanical keyboard because I'm a giant nerd. The left side is suspiciously similar to an MCP 23018 IO expander reference design for driving button matrices, such as the ones in mechanical keyboards. The right half of the keyboard is literally an Arduino Leonardo. That design I was showing you earlier, uh, that was a car stereo mod that I designed for a client a while ago. Uh, it's an LM358 amp reference design uh, combined with an AP6502 switching regulator reference design and literally an Arduino Uno. Uh, it's a bunch of off-the-shelf circuits and God damn it, I am proud of how well it did the job. It's tempting to think that only small-time outfits would build projects by copying and pasting, but that's, that is just straight not true. This is an FBI tracking device that Kathy Thomas, an environmental activist, found stuck to her bumper. It's made of two stacked boards. The top is a U-Blocks all-in-one GPS transponder module. This was cutting edge in 1999 and has a very helpful data sheet. The bottom board has a ZMix 3-500 MHz transceiver chip and an RFM RF1172 filter, and both implementations look an awful lot like the reference design. Uh, actually, it looks like the FBI did change the design a bit. On the top side, it looks like they added some capacitors by hand. I, I just love the idea of some lantern-jawed FBI agent, black suit, sunglasses, earpiece, just delicately blowing away flux fumes as he soldered this up. Implementing reference designs is a lot like copying code from Stack Overflow. We pretend we understand it, we hit Control C, we hit Control V, and then we make pre-recorded conference talks about how good we are at engineering. Implementing reference designs, or at least starting out with them, uh, is usually a good idea. Uh, these, they're design engineers of these companies, like real humans with personalities and families that make these things. Uh, these guys will, are, will, are often friendly and will help diagnose issues in your implementation. Some data sheets have, although have sleazy reference designs that recommend specific parts from companies that they have relationships with. Or they even recommend their own parts, especially the expensive ones for some reason. Why sell a chip when you can sell a solution? The point is, uh, reference designs and breakout boards are starting points. As a rule, they are not ready for production, and it's up to the engineer to find out why. Good engineering should require rigorous testing on the bench and in real life. I mean, after all, when it comes to breaking stuff, the user outranks the engineer. Uh, it's, up to every, it's up to everyone to find out where those reference designs fall short and don't get too overcommitted to them. Uh, it always makes sense to use the right part, even if it's harder to develop over the long term. Speaking of testing, uh, as of 2020, electrical engineers are still incapable of jacking into their electronics projects. I consider this a grave oversight, and instead they add debugging interfaces to upload and diagnose software and to snoop on uh, critical signal lines and other, other critical paths. Uh, by the way, this right here is the best slide in the deck. Uh, I wanted a picture of a guy in a VR headset messing with a circuit board, but the best I could find was this was this guy messing with a whiteboard and he's drawing a cat. I, I know because he wrote cat. 
Anyways, the next best thing to jacking into your circuit board, besides jacking into a, into a whiteboard, uh, is adding a debug interface. Some of these things, like these spy headers, just expose the lines of communication between uh, the microcontroller and its peripherals. Uh, these make it really easy to connect logic analyzers and scopes, and they can also be used to upload firmware. Other ports are dedicated specifically to the software, to diagnostics and programming. Uh, this is a JTAG header. Don't worry about the acronym because it's just it's basically a programming interface for a microcontroller. It also provides access to debugging tools like setting breakpoints, which doesn't like sound impressive if you're used to writing real programs. But trust me, this is this is hot stuff on a microcontroller. Anyways, using this port, you can burn new firmware onto the device, extract the existing firmware, uh, snoop the memory, and just generally do all kinds of handy low-level debugging functions. Uh, you can order microcontrollers pre-programmed, and this functionality is extremely dangerous, right? So it makes sense to remove this header when you go to market, especially if it's one of these fancy headers that just accepts this convenient spring-loaded programmer. Otherwise, somebody could say, take your commercial off-the-shelf hardware, jab a convenient spring-loaded programmer into, into that header, suck out your firmware, steal your secrets, modify your firmware to make the device catch fire, and re-upload it. In the past 70 years of electrical engineering, real engineers trademark have made many powerful anti-tampering countermeasures. You have access prevention, write once fuses, code signing, and code integrity checks. They're increasingly common and easy to use. That said, I don't think I've ever used them and I don't think I've ever met anyone who used them. You might, you might think that it doesn't get any more nauseating than a convenient unsecured port with firmware access. So allow me to direct your attention to this little bastard. This is a serial port, and it's even more common than a JTAG header, and in my opinion, even more dangerous. Uh, all serial ports have at least three pins. You have a receive, a transmit, and a ground. If you ever used an Arduino, or you had a computer in 1995, you might have heard of a serial port, and that's exactly what these are. What's neat about a serial port is that they're often used to communicate with humans, uh, not complicated devices, and they communicate in plain text. Uh, all you gotta do is get a USB to serial adapter and you could barge right in. This is an FTDI basic from SparkFun and I highly recommend it, but there really are like a bazillion USB to serial adapters out there and they, they do the same thing. Uh, I keep all mine in an Altoids tin so they stay fresh. Mm, asynchronous data, collect the whole set. It's really important by the way to, to first use a multimeter to figure out what voltage it is. Cause you know, you connect a five volt, uh, you, you five volt serial adapter to a three volt device and you're going to need a second device anyways you just look for three to six parallel holes on the board and that's probably a serial port uh, you'll often find multiple headers on a board uh, if the device has multiple uh, microcontrollers which which is increasingly common uh, one of these holes will have a little starburst around it or like an extra thick trace where it connects to the ground plane and that's that's your ground you might need some guesswork to find the receive and transmit pins. You really, that just comes down to try out the various combinations until something works. But sometimes you get lucky and a friendly engineer will do you a solid and label it right there on the board. Ah, debug headers. Uh, what do you think we'll find on this serial port? Uh, does it stream maybe some debug logs, some core dumps, maybe some printf style status strings left over from development? Could it be a little bare bones command line to access hidden functions and factory diagnostics? Uh, maybe it's an encoded channel for a technician to connect some super secret maintenance tool. Or maybe it's a bash shell with root access and default username and password. And you bet your ass that's what it is. Every embedded Linux distro I know exposes a shell on its dedicate on that dedicated serial port. Uh, usually that command line is root because creating you know, separate accounts with reduced privileges is hard. Um, usually the username is root and the password is root or it's admin or it's password. Some fancy devs change the password and like that said, I've never seen a manufacturer provision unique passwords onto the devices, even though they totally should. Uh, at best, they'll derive it from the serial number uh, or Mac address. And if you can find that algorithm, like you're in like Flynn. Uh, Many manufacturers will change every one of their passwords to the same password and then put that password into a manual that's available for download NDA free from their site. This is especially common for routers and other devices that should really be secured better than this. 
Um, you might have been smart and like set your SSH server on the device to use to not use pass keys and only certificates, but you should know that this has no effect on the hardware serial port. Uh, I don't actually think you can set that to require a certificate and not a pass key. Uh, anyways, like you just take that device with crazy hard security, log in, install a new private key, and uh, you now no longer need to sneak into the boiler room to mess with the HVAC. This brings us to the filthiest crevasse of the embedded world. I must stop showing you pictures of circuit boards because this foul miasma is invisible. It's firmware and it's the libraries that these systems are built on. Trigger warnings, unpatched vulnerabilities, decade old kernels, unencrypted networks, and literal fire. You guys are pretty plugged into security penetration and you're probably aware that embedded devices are notoriously insecure. Uh, and I, not much has changed. <laughs> In preparation for this talk, I went to Shodan, uh, Rami, Mal Rami Malek's uh, search engine of choice, and I, I did a search for DropBear. DropBear is a super lightweight SSH server that's included with BusyBox, which is in turn included with most embedded distros. The overwhelming majority of these devices are running Linux 2.6. The latest version is 5.7, and I can't imagine how many of these have been, how few of these have been patched for shell shock and, and all those other vulnerabilities we've seen lately. Yeah. This one was my favorite. Uh, this poor Canadian bastard's cable box is running DropBear SSH version 2012.55, as in version 55 of the year 2012. The last time this guy's cable box was updated, Barack Obama was beginning his second term. There have been some security up. It, there have been some security improvements since then. Uh, here are some iOmega NAS devices that back up people's sensitive files. Uh, iOmega was kind enough to announce to the open web that these are NAS devices, presumably full of sensitive files. Uh, they, they, these things support only TLS 1.2, which I have read leaves them vulnerable to the Golden Doodle variant of the Poodle attack. I don't know what the hell you guys are smoking when you name these like when you name these vulnerabilities, but this is a device designed to keep your files safe and up to date, and iOmega's devs have made them unsafe by not updating them. Uh, but surely it's it's better in industry than it is in consumer products. I mean, these are devices that are going to be in the they're going to be in service for decades, not something that you're going to like throw out when I don't know when Steve Jobs. I guess back in the day when Steve Jobs got on stage. Uh, anyways, there are a lot of industrial control protocols used to coordinate heavy duty equipment. Uh, these things have failovers, backups, and like other useful properties that come in handy when your software can kill people. Uh, or if you've hacked a car, and come on, like it's 2020, who hasn't hacked a car? Uh, you're familiar with the CAN bus. There's also BACnet, which is used to connect like HVAC and building safety equipment. Um, and you have the Modbus, which is used to connect heavy equipment in factories and processing plants and stuff. Um, as a rule, these protocols are unencrypted. Which, which isn't as bad as it sounds. Like if you're connecting a conveyor belt to the control console, like it's your own factory. You don't, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to secure it that bad. It's not like you're hooking your industrial control equipment into the open web, right? If you have dubious morals and you want to control 40 relays in Romania, then you're in luck, my dude. See, the mistake wasn't putting the Ethernet port on the controller. Uh, the mistake was putting the other end of the Ethernet cable into a router. Here's another intriguing device in Castelnovo di Soto, Ital uh, Italy. What's neat about this thing, besides the fact that it's probably an Italian temperature controller that you know shows up in a search engine, is that InventSense supplied the safety devices that were hacked in Saudi Arabia with that super advanced Triton malware. I, I'm not sure if this is the exact device we're talking about here, but you get the idea. You connect dangerous industrial equipment to one end, and you connect the other end to a direct link to everyone on Earth with a command line. Uh, Triton was this malware that disabled gas detection safety systems in a chemical refinery, uh, presumably with the intention of flooding the facility with toxins. Uh, through pure chance, uh, th it was caught and thwarted, but had it succeeded, Triton would have been the first malware with casualties. Uh, they really should have kept a better eye on these key switches. Um, it, what's, what's interesting is that uh, in the Triton attack, they actually did prevent these things from connecting online, but they had poor internal controls. 
So uh, somebody who got access to the facility was was easily able to do a firmware attack and break that security wide open. Uh, moving on, let's set some stuff on fire. Uh, embedded devices increasingly have consequences. Like not only are we sticking processors and everything, but we're hooking these processors up to more and more subsystems. Uh, this fire here was caused by a firmware attack. This USB power bank was connected to a USB-C quick charger. Uh, there's a microcontroller in charge, so to speak, of the, the charging subsystem so that it can so that uh, the device can demand uh, as much current as it can handle. So this attack is launched on the wall wart by using it to charge an infected phone. The phone puts the charger into device firmware update through that USB port, and then it DFUs on a hacked firmware that instructs the power management chip to wait for the target device and then run 20 volts through it. Uh, this means that a malware attack can blow your phone up. Neat. It's a good thing that these that these uh, wall wart manufacturers aren't just copying and pasting pre-written firmware onto an unmodified reference design. If they did that, uh, the attack would hit tons of different devices from different manufacturers, and it would be a total nightmare to patch out of existence. Anyways, this is where we are. Uh, we cargo cult schematics. We leave all access debug ports open to the public. We deploy outdated software. We never update it. We open it up to the to the internet. Uh, we connect more and more of the circuit to the hackable part, and we make ugly boards. Uh, these are just some of the disgusting secrets of real hardware. So what do we do about it? I mean, as a rule, design defensively. Uh, the bad guys are going to buy some units, and then they have all the time in the world to bust them open. So don't make it easy. Clean up after yourself. Uh, Get rid of those debug ports. Prevent one part of the circuit uh, from damaging another. Use fuses and thermistors to limit hacker to limit hackers' reach. Uh, don't blindly trust reference designs. Uh, force those force any bad actors to like have to start desoldering uh, parts. Get yourself involved earlier in the process so you have more influence on the look, feel, and configuration of the pro of the project. Don't put something online or even prov even add provisions to bring it online unless it's absolutely necessary. There are tons of count there are tons of measures like intranet, private APNs, and just straight not putting a connectivity on it uh, that can provide a lifetime of protection. And finally, use the anti-tampering devices that are already available to you. Like it's kind of a pain in the butt, but you know, like life sucks, wear a hat. Uh, <laughs> as for the hackers, the makers, and the modders. Like, don't be discouraged by how sophisticated and polished other engineers' work looks. Like, it, that, get, that gizmo might look really sleek on the outside, but on the inside, it's just full of disgusting secrets, and they're waiting for you to unearth them. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'm Zach Friedman, and I really hope you've enjoyed my presentation and the entire Virtual Hope Conference. This has been a, a blast to research and, uh, and record, and I really... I really hope you guys have had a great time over this past week. Uh, huge thanks to the organizers, especially Bernie, for letting me do this talk. And uh, thanks, Brooke, for being a most excellent camera person. And of course, thanks to you. Uh, you, keep, you keep hope alive through 2020 and far into the future. And I'll see you on the other end of this pandemic. And uh, when we do, I got a cold beer with your name on it. <laughs>